at HitLab, a uh, good colleague of mine and, and a passionate uh, digital health evangelist as well and scientist, and Dr. Elizabeth Jacobs, who heads up innovation and healthcare tech at uh, the main medical center. Uh, thank you both for joining and I'm gonna go off camera and, and Prem will be interviewing uh, Dr. Jacobs uh, going forward here, thank you. Thanks, Stan. Uh, so good morning, Dr. Jacobs. Uh, welcome to the program. And uh, we look forward to your presentation and uh, delighted to uh, that you were able to attend. To start off, perhaps you could spend a few minutes uh, just as an introduction, uh, give us a little bit of your professional background and your areas of interest. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Elizabeth Jacobs. Uh, I'm actually a practicing primary care physician, a general internist. Um, and a lifelong uh, investigator. Uh, the area that I've worked in is actually advancing health equity and reducing health disparities, particularly for uh, populations, people of color, uh, people who don't speak English well, and those living in uh, rural health contexts. And so that's some of the work that I do today. And I'm excited to have the opportunity to uh, talk about how do we think about uh, innovation and advancements in science um, keeping in mind the health equity uh, aspect of the work that we do. That's fantastic. So what are some of the factors that contribute to uh, the routine healthcare disparities that you see uh, as you compare it to the rural and the urban setting? Perhaps you could say a few words on that. Yes, absolutely. So usually the factors that actually contribute to health disparities are this um, are social uh, drivers or determinants of health. There's, that's a big buzzword these days. Um, and so if you think about it, uh, a driver might be, uh, do you have access to healthy food? A determinant might be, um, where were you educated? Um, and what's your ability to uh, speak and understand English uh, and understand the healthcare information that you're getting? I think we see a lot of that right now in some of the issues related to getting people access over this past year to mm -hmm relevant and factual information about COVID-19, testing, quarantining, um, as well as, uh, as vaccine uh, testing. So, uh, sorry, uh, vaccine participation. So one, really interestingly, I think there's some real similarities between uh, rural populations and urban populations that experience health disparities. And that has to do with health literacy. So their ability to understand um, science, um, and uh, uh, information about what they can do to actually uh, participate in healthcare or get a vaccine. There's that. There's also um, issues related to access and that access might be geographic or economic. And then a lot of the social determinants that are experienced by these two groups are very similar. So low income, um, uh, et cetera, uh, usually in urban areas, it's more related to structural racism that can also uh, uh, lead to health uh, disparities. So those are some of the things that are very similar and different across the two groups. So when conducting your research, are there specific approaches you take uh, to gain these grants and uh, uh, to work with these organizations and foundations that you've partnered with over the years? Uh, are there any insights that you have for uh, the audience today? Yeah, I do. Um, so I will I will use some of the experience that we're working on right now. Is um, I mostly do research that where I uh, collaborate with community partners. Um, I grew up in Southern California. I'm obviously a very privileged person, and I'm also white, <laughs> so I can't really understand what are the issues that are faced if you live in rural America. Oh, I forgot bandwidth, by the way. Bandwidth is a huge issue in rural America. Now that I've moved to Maine, that's a huge issue. Um, and if you think about tech, you know, thinking about engaging people, let's say on an app or something like that, that's an area where you could create equity. If we don't also make sure that people in, in distant areas also have access to that technology um, through their bandwidth uh, accessibility. But um, so I partner with communities. Um, to, and I interview people who live in those communities. Right now we're doing a vaccine hesitancy study in Maine where we're actually interviewing uh, individuals living in rural Maine and key stakeholders to understand what it is that is leading to um, concerns about the vaccine, um, what are their barriers, um, and um, we're going to test some key messages about how we can move them along um, in the decision-making process more towards getting a vaccine um, and thinking about the key messages we could do. So that's a great way 
to, I mean, I'm sure there's people on this call who think about this from a user standpoint. I think that's a way you can think about it from a research standpoint too. So if you're uh, if you're developing something, you need to go to your users and say, is this intuitive? Do you know how to use it? Is it what's gonna make it easier for you? It's the same uh, a lot in research as well, is partnering with those people and communities that can help you understand how to advance um, some of the interventions that we want to do um, and that will reduce health, uh, sorry, health disparities. Are there any other takeaways that you can offer? Because I think that's an excellent uh, similarity that you brought together uh, on the vaccine hesitancy and the research outcomes. Are there any other uh, takeaways that would be more broadly applicable to this audience uh, who are attending today? Yeah, I think one of the things that I think a lot about in terms of innovation um, is that not everyone has the same access to um, things that have innovated, uh, things we've innovated, I should say. So I think going back to the vaccines, obviously I'm a primary care physician who's thinking a lot about trying to help get people vaccinated. It's very important um, to me and I think to our country and the world, obviously, um, is um, is um, that in the last year, right, We the way the vaccines were developed, they were developed in a way where they were meant to be accessible to everyone. And they're being delivered for free for the most part to people who don't have economic access to them. Um, they're being delivered in a way that, let's say if you're in this country and you're not documented, you mm -hmm. can actually go and get a vaccine and no one's gonna keep track of you in a way that might be um, create anxiety for you. And so that's what I think we need to think about as we innovate what are ways in which our innovations could actually exacerbate or create health disparities? And how can we innovate in ways or, or think about that as part of the problem that we need to solve? I think COVID's give us, given us some great examples of how people have been able to do that. Um, and so I think we can learn a lot from this past year, uh, or sorry, more than a past year, unfortunately. No, that's a, no, that's a, Excellent point because uh, the past year and a half or 18 months have been quite uh, quite uh, concerning. The other point I wanted to bring up is uh, while you're talking about disparity within the United States, do you see any of this uh, uh, from a global standpoint? Uh, do you see uh, some of these lessons learned, takeaways and so forth? So perhaps you could frame that uh, from the United States uh, to the global side and uh, present uh, your thoughts on that front. Yes, absolutely. I mean, some of the same accessibility problems that we have in the States exist in other parts of the world or are even worse. Mm -hmm. um, and um, let me, I'll give you an example. I also happen to be collaborating with someone at Maine Health right now um, and someone at the University of um, uh, New England uh, that they have created uh, a low tech way of being able to uh, test breast cancer tissue to see if it's estrogen receptor positive or negative. And the reason why this is really innovative and they're applying for a grant um, through NIH right now to look to see if they can we can use this and deploy it in Tanzania is because the immunochemistry uh, uh, methods that are used in the States and in more high income countries like ours actually aren't accessible to most women in Tanzania. Um, and right now, only about 10% of women actually um, get this testing done if they have breast cancer. And then what happens is if, the, if someone, uh, that testing can determine whether you um, would benefit um, from easily, more accessible and less expensive forms of therapy like hormonal therapy, right? And so this is a great example of innovation, thinking about the needs of low and middle income countries um, so that we can address some of these barriers that that other other countries face. So I I think this I think what we learned and one of the reasons why I'm engaged is because I am a community based investigator and they know that to be able to implement something like that in Tanzania, you have to number you have to understand the context. You have to know what patients take it up. Who are the laboratory um, personnel who are going to be doing that testing and can you train them and can you get them the equipment that they need. So it's not just in the big city where it's offered. And so there's a lot of ways in which you need to engage stakeholders in different types of communities. So it's not only the people who would be benefiting from the testing, but also the people who would be implementing the testing. 
I could keep you here for another half hour. I'm watching the chat. I don't know if you're watching the chat, but uh, in general, there's a lot of positive remarks and uh, they have complimented you on uh, being local champions to deploy scientific outcomes and so forth. So congratulations to you and your program. So uh, speaking in the context of uh, the community and uh, given that we have a community that is attending today's session, on a personal level, uh, would you be able to recommend to these individuals some things that they could do to support or to uh, work through some of these disparities and other things, uh, given that all of the attendees today likely have uh, a strong uh, interest in the healthcare and healthcare deployment area? Yes, absolutely. Number one, um, having diversity in your workforce. So uh, people who come from the communities that traditionally experience health disparities are gonna help provide insights to you as to how uh, your innovations might um, contribute or reduce um, to health inequity. Um, number two, there are people who have expertise um, in these different areas. And um, I think we've seen also over the last year that if you don't, if, if you don't have the experience of looking at and trying to understand and solve health inequities on a right routine basis, you don't necessarily see how your work might contribute to them or how your work might be a contribution um, to reducing them. And so I think bringing in diversity of workforce as well as diversity of thinkers into your organizations um, can help you uh, think about those things. So a lot of places now have uh, you know, chief uh, equity officers or diversity equity inclusion officers. A lot of times those individuals also have some of that expertise, but there are so many scientists I know, because this is an area that I work in, who specifically have de dedicated their careers to advancing health equity. And they bring a really unique and uh, important perspective that you could employ as consultants um, or within your organizations. And so um, I think that that's one, a couple, two different ways that people could actually address this issue. On an ongoing basis, do you also recommend uh, listening forums uh, in the organization? Uh, to, uh, to engage and to augment the programs? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that that's really important. Um, one of the things that I do um, in my own uh, life as a scientist and also as a leader is I really value uh, the opinion and input from people at all different levels. I have some expertise, but there's, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, um, I'm not a teenager anymore. So if I had a young person who was 20 who knew better how to use something than I do, they could give me great input. Even though they're not high up in my organization, they have something really important that they could bring to the table. So I think especially if you have listening sessions where there are people from all across your organization who you know, could potentially uh, give input and help people think about some of the issues you wanna address, um, I think that could be really valuable. You, you probably have people in your own organizations that are the communities that you wanna engage uh, and they can they can bring uh, their voices to the table too. It's a great we question. Have a word of, we have about a minute left and uh, on behalf of HitLab and all the attendees, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to walk us through this uh, important uh, area and uh, look forward to uh, catching up with you at a future session and perhaps have a longer session to, to walk through all these different parts. So, um, Again, thank you again. And I will turn this over to Stan, who's gonna 